it prolongs operating time, which is a factor to creating um, to causing cataracts. 20 gauge, I think, in this scenario is just uh, inappropriate. Ken asks, can you talk about frill? Everyone, including me, and a couple of your patients complain about it. Could it be caused by the ports kind of like punching a nail through wood? <clears throat> Until I started this blog, I never heard of frill. And I believe frill is residual vitreous left. I believe frill is actually uh, vitreous, which is not removed during the vitrectomy. And it is imp I'm going to first say that it is impossible to remove all the vitreous with vitrectomy surgery. For whatever reasons, you can't get out all the vitreous. I believe that patients that complain of frill are patients that had an incomplete vitrectomy where most of the offending vitreous was not removed. I know I just said that you can't remove all the vitreous, but I think in those patients that are complaining about frill, I think simply not enough vitreous was removed and that there's still some residual floaters and the surgeons are just blaming it on what they're calling frill. Steven says, I understand 1% to 2% risk for retinal detachment. Okay. Ken says, sorry, I iPad keyboard. Got it. Uh, Richard, holistic health care isn't covered by insurance either. How could insurance be the litmus test of legitimacy if anything is just the opposite? Don't they do lots of YAG treatments in Europe? Isn't it a com common procedure there? Uh, Richard, you're... You're asked, you're hitting on a lot of topics that I don't, I'm not familiar with. Um, the only thing that I can say after your statement is that as far as I'm aware, in America, insurance, medical insurance covers vitrectomy um, for this procedure. I am not aware how how often YAG laser is done in Europe or what the indications are. I'm sorry, I just I just don't know. Ah, Stephen, uh, Stephen clarifies his comment. I understand 1% to 2% risk of retinal tear is an average statistic. Is this statistic more, less, or the same for you? I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm, I'm better or worse than anybody. I think 1% to 2% is the, the national average. Um, and I'm going to say, in my experience, it's probably um, exactly, I, I think my, my surgical statistics fall right into that range. Leslie says, my retina doctor said that I would get used to the floater and it shouldn't really bother my vision. Well, you know, that doesn't always happen. So I am partially blind in my left eye and have a floater in my right eye. Oh, Leslie, you wrote in the other day. So I am partially blind in my left eye and have a floater in my right eye that is very aggravating and it does heavily affect my vision, but he makes me feel like I'm just a complainer. There are so many of you f that are discounted with your actual complaints. And I don't understand why if you had the same complaints, yet you had cataracts causing your vision loss. I'm not so sure you'd be discounted in this way, nor would you be labeled as a complainer. Um, I believe what I may have advocated for you was that perhaps you you might consider getting a second opinion to see, or at least visit with someone who's a little bit more compassionate uh, to your problems. VZ says, what, do you, what gauge do you use? 23 or 25? How many incisions? Do you use stitches? Do you dye the vitreous? Uh, I use 25 gauge almost exclusively. I think 23 gauge leaves holes, which uh, cause, may lead to hypotony. This is just my preference. Uh, how many incisions? We all use three. One for the left hand, one for the right hand, and one for a tube that keeps the uh, eye uh, inflated with saline. Do you use stitches? No. By definition, 23, 25, and 27 gauge uh, stitches are sutureless. 
Do I dye the vitreous? Sometimes I do, and I only use Brilliant Blue. There are no uh, toxicity reports using uh, Brilliant Blue. Many times I do not use uh, dye, but when I do, I do use Brilliant Blue. Vicky says, if I don't have a cataract now, what are the chances I will develop them after FOV? 50, and she's 56 years old. I'm going to say the chance of you developing a cataract is 100% with or without FOV. I think what you're really asking is how soon after FOV are you going to develop cataract? And I really don't know because I don't know how much of a cataract you have now. But let's switch things around just a little bit. You're going to have to need cataract surgery anyway. And that's true of most everyone. You're plagued by vision loss. You're bothered by vision loss either from the cataract and or the floaters. So if you're going to have to have cataract surgery regardless of FOV, that seems to be a moot point to me. So I would say have the FOV if you don't need cataract surgery now, but expecting that you're going to need cataract surgery in the future because that's true anyway. Jim says, I only have vision in one eye, and I have asteroid floaters in that eye. I would like to have FOV done, but I am concerned with the risk in only having one functioning, eye, one functioning eye. Just wondering what your thoughts are on this. <clears throat> My thoughts are the following, Jim, is that I think that if you are, understand the risks, and the risks are tiny but could be devastating, the chances of blindness is about one chance in 10,000 or one chance in 15,000. And again, that blindness could be caused by infection. I believe my job as a physician is to educate you as to what your risks are with regard to the therapies that you choose, and you need to make the decision. I, I, wouldn't, if, I wouldn't advise you otherwise that Basically, you need to make an informed decision um, as to what's best for you. However, as a physician, once I counsel you on the risks, I think that um, my job would also be to support whatever decision you make. VZ asks, what, a van what kind of anesthesia do we use? We generally use sedation. That means that you have an IV placed in your arm. You're going to get some... Uh, some drugs injected through the IV into your arm that's going to make you woozy. It may put you out, uh, put you to sleep for about five minutes. During that time, I'm going to numb your eye with a needle. Um, that injection is called a retrobulbar injection that completely numbs your eye and completely, completely makes it impossible for you to move during the operation. The operation is completely comfortable. You are usually awake so that you can go home within a half hour after the operation. Brent says, thank you for interpreting my bad grammar mistakes, but correctly. You're welcome. Mark asks, what about the long-term risks of glaucoma? I don't think that, I, I don't think there are, in, are any. Uh, the only reason this may become a question is that after vitrectomy, after any eye operation, a common uh, drug to use in the postoperative period during the healing process is to use some steroid drops. In about 10% of the population, this can cause an increase in uh, pressure in the eye. And that may be a risk factor for glaucoma. But this usually is completely reversed when we stop the drops. So I would say that there is no long-term risk of glaucoma just because you had a vitrectomy. Amy asks, could you explain what gauge is? And that's a really good question. Um, gauge is actually the thickness or the size of the instruments. The higher the number the thinner the instruments. So a 20 gauge instrument is fatter or thicker than a 23 gauge instrument, which is even thicker to my preferred uh, system, which is a 25 gauge system. 
And so why is this significant? The industry standard, or for 25 years, we use something called 20 gauge instrumentation. And that, as, as I said, creates, th that uses thicker instruments, which requires thicker holes be made into the eye. The holes, if you will, for lack of a better term, are so large it requires actual stitching to close the holes to make them watertight. About 10 years ago, sutureless techniques uh, or instruments were, dis uh, uh, were, were devised. And what I like to use is something called 25 gauge instrumentation. These instruments are really, really thin and they're really, really tiny. They don't require stitches and they do just as good a job as the 20 gauge, but there's less damage to the eye and the healing is much, much quicker. So the practical value to small gauge instrumentation or to 25 gauge instrumentation is that the surgery is much faster because you don't have to um, use stitches and the healing is much faster. Yet at the same time, the same job is, is, is accomplished. Brent says, in the unfortunate event that a tear did develop in surgery, do you treat that in the same operation? And if so, does the tear necessarily cause lasting damage to vision? Absolutely, if we recognize a tear during the operation, we fix it at that time. Does it cause any permanent lasting damage to the vision? No. And the reason is a tear to the retina almost always occurs in an area of the retina which is not used for cent or required for central vision. Mark says, thank you, Dr. Wong. You are spot on. I'm 55, had my cataracts removed, then FOV on my right eye. I'm floater free in that eye. Before I found a sympathetic surgeon, I was told it's just your eye. You'll get used to it. Or if you were my brother, I would tell you not to do it. Um, you're extremely knowledgeable and you are extremely kind and generous. Mark, thank you very much for your support. I'm glad you found from, uh, some help from someone I know very well as you do. Chrissy's online and she would like me to bring up the difference between medically necessary and cosmetic procedures. A lot of patients think that surgery isn't covered because um, they don't understand the difference. That's a really good point. Um, I wrote an article on the blog addressing just this, but in a nutshell, medically necessary is usually covered by insurance. Cosmetic means that there is no medical reason to do this. And as cataract surgery is covered and is medically necessary, so too, in my experience, is vitrectomy to remove floaters so that you can see better. An example of a cosmetic procedure which is has no medical benefit would be a rhinoplasty or a nose job, uh, perhaps a facelift, etc. Something that is purely cosmetic. Uh, vitrectomy so that you can see better or FOV in I think all cases as far as I'm concerned or as I'm aware of is absolutely covered by insurance. Stephen says, if a tear is an unfortunate consequence of the FOV, does it usually happen during the FOV procedure or mo more often afterwards? Um, in my experience, if a tear is sustained, it happens immediately uh, because it is actually related to the, int the uh, instruments being introduced into and out of the eye. Um, tears or detachments that, uh, that occur afterwards, it is possible in theory that it could happen and we're talking only about FOV. Certainly patients with for that have vitrectomy for other reasons can detach after surgery. But I think for FOV, the ins, the insulting event or the or the retinal tear um, is more likely to be caused immediately uh, during the operation. Nancy says, what is the recuperative time post vitrectomy? I live in New York City. If I traveled to your office, 